St. John's United Church of Christ in Orangeburg, Pennsylvania. My name is Jamie Barton, and I'll be leading worship this morning along with the help of Christopher Holler. And we'd like to welcome everybody. I'd like to say that uh, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here and we're glad to have you with us. Um, we open our worship service uh, every Sunday with joys. And, uh, this is no different. I'd like to share a joy. We, um, this is a big joy for a lot of us. We're going to resume church in this wonderful, beautiful sanctuary that we all know and love so well on June 28th. June 28th, we're going to resume church services as a 10 o'clock worship service. Um, it's a huge joy. Yes, there absolutely will be a lot of do's and don'ts. Um, different things that we'll need to uh, do differently, but we're going to be together, worshiping together. Uh, you'll be seeing emails and or letters from Bill Holler, and if nothing else, we will walk you through a magic come here. So that's a huge joy, and our dear brother Christopher Holler has a joy he'd like to share. I just wanted to thank everybody who sent me graduation gifts. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Thanks, Chris. The other thing we do is we take a moment to greet each other and give each other a sign of peace. So if, uh, let's take this moment right now to wish each other a sign of peace and the peace and love of God be with you all. Let us pray. It's not too easy being bogged down with life right now. God means for us to celebrate life, to rejoice, to give Him tribute for all the good He does among men, and to be free to fully be ourselves. Therefore, He gives us the gift of love to cleanse and to inspire. Let this be a holy moment of receiving. Lord, we hunger for righteousness. Feed our souls with your truth and grace. And allow us to be satisfied with the bread of life. Amen. Let's pray a prayer of confession. Dear God, we know that you know all that is in our hearts and in our minds. And we come to you knowing that we have but to ask for your forgiveness and repent of our sins to receive your healing grace. We ask that from you now as we confess our sins, let us now take a silent time to review our week and remember where we have done wrong or what we have not done the good we should have done. And confess in our hearts to the Lord. Friends in Christ, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is God's gift to the world so that he, we can know abundant life. Our first reading is Ruth chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Our next reading is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that, she, that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. 
She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my, anoint my head with oil, and, but she has anointed my feet with oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here ends the reading. At this time, we're going to have uh, fun with Zoom, and we're going to have our moment with our children right now. Um, All right. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, it's good to see all your smiling faces, everybody up bright and early. I can't wait to see you. So I got a story to tell you, okay? You ready for a story? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's this, um, now I'm, I'm, before I got to preface the story with this, a Pharisee. Did anybody ever hear that word, a Pharisee? <laughs> no, we don't use that too often, do we, Austin? Pharisee. No, we don't. So Pharisees were back in the time of Jesus. These were these guys that, that, that thought they were closer to God. They thought they were better than everybody else, okay? So anyway, I'm going to read a, a scripture from the Bible, then I'm going to tell you a story, okay? So just listen to this for a little bit. So now one Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So we went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat at the table. And there was a woman who had lived a very bad life and she wasn't a very nice person and she lived in a town and she heard that Jesus was coming to the Pharisee and was going to be eating at his table. And so she brought with her um, a jar of perfume. Okay. And she came and she wasn't invited to the dinner. Um, and she stood behind Jesus and she knew about all the miracles he did. She knew about all the good things he did. And she was crying because she loved him very much and wanted to be close to him. And she was crying and her tears, she was crying so much, her tears were falling on his feet. And she didn't have anything to wipe her tears off with. So she used her hair. She had long hair like, like you guys have. And she wiped Jesus's feet with her long hair and cleaned it off. And then she was kissing him and hugging him and she was um, being very nice to him. Um, and you got to remember in times of Jesus, they lived in the, in the desert, right? It was very sandy and they didn't have shoes or sneakers. They probably didn't even have socks. They had sandals or bare feet. So it felt nice for somebody to wash your feet for you. So let, let me ask you a question. Who here, and show me by a raise of hand, who, or a thumbs up, who here has ever been invited to a party? Yep, everybody. I know because we're having a party right now, sort of, aren't we? <laughs> right? We've all been invited to a party. Now, let me, so sometimes you get an invitation in the mail, right? Sometimes you get an email. Sometimes you get a text. Sometimes one of your friends calls you, right, Lola, and they'll say, Hey, yeah. come over to my house for hamburgers, right? Or some, you never get party invitations all different ways. Now, let me ask you this. How many times have you ever heard of somebody 
going to a party that wasn't invited. You've heard that, Molly and Macy? It happened yesterday. It did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen too often, does it? People, if you're not invited. And our story today, this woman, she heard about Jesus was going to be at this dinner party at the Pharisee. And Jesus came and, and uh, she, he welcomed her. And even though she wasn't a very nice person, she wanted to be closer to Jesus. She knew he was performing miracles and she knew that he was closer to God, even though he didn't seem very uppity or he didn't think he was better than anybody else. Um, and, and the man, Simon, who invited, he was the Pharisee. Remember what I said about the Pharisee? What I say about them? Do you remember? Um... What? Remember, I said the Pharisees, they, they kind of thought they were better than everybody else. Remember, they thought they were closer to God and they thought that, oh, you little people, you don't, you don't belong with me. And, and this Pharisee was upset. This guy was upset that Jesus was so nice to this woman, that Jesus was so nice. So the thing is, we have to remember in God's eyes, we're all equal. All of us here and, and, and everybody across the world, we're all equal. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes, it does. Good, because no one's better than anybody else in God's eyes. He created us all in his image. And Jesus tried to show that to the Pharisee, and the Pharisee didn't really notice it. So let's, um, let's close with a little prayer. Can we say a prayer? I'm going to take my hat off and show you my fancy hair. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the wonderful children, and we miss them so much. But thank you for keeping everybody so safe, and we ask you to remind us that everybody's equal in your eyes and that you love us all. You love us all the same and treat us all equally. And we too should love everybody the same. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you guys. And now can everybody, can everybody say hello to everybody in the congregation? Do you wanna say anything? Hello. 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 hello, we miss you, right? Hi, Molly. <laughs> FaceTime me. <laughs> Ask. All right, Rick, we're going to stop recording, but we can stay on. Can we do that? I'm going to, yep, I'm going to. Thank you. It was great seeing you guys again. And can't wait till we can join each other and see each other in person instead of virtually. Looking forward to that happening soon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so, the, the parable that Chris just read, the sinful woman forgiven, is simple enough, yet there's some intriguing concepts. paraphrase the parable that Jesus told to Simon who was a Pharisee. And, and, and my version is going to go something like this. So there's these two guys and they each owe a bank credit. Money. One guy owes him 50 bucks. The other guy owes a thousand dollars. Now neither of these guys has the money to pay their debt. And the bank, the creditor, says, forget about it. You don't have to pay it. He tells the first guy, he says, you don't have to pay me the $50 that you owe me, sir. And he tells the other fella, sir, you don't have to pay me the $1,000 that you owe me. Both debts are forgiven. So 
Jesus asked Simon, which one of these guys loves the bank more? Which one of them loves the creditor more? And Simon responds, well, the guy that, who owed a thousand bucks, right? The guy who owes more money is much more appreciative, isn't he? It's simple. It's straightforward, no questions, no problem. But then Jesus compares the story to sin, and specifically with a woman of the city who was a sinner. Luke 7, verse 37, that Chris just read it. A woman of the city was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. So clearly the, the one who has sinned more appreciates forgiveness more. So is Jesus suggesting if you are forgiven much, then you love much. If you're forgiving little, then you love little. The greater your sin, the greater your love. The smaller your sin, the smaller your love. If you sin a little bit, just a tiny little sin, if you only owe 50 bucks, Given may mean little to you. Now, of course, what else is involved here is certainly amount of jealousy. Right? There's going to be anger, envy. I mean, if I knew my sins were going to be forgiven, I would have sinned more, right? If I knew the bank wasn't going to collect these debts, I would have borrowed more money. This isn't really an attitude that's foreign to us, is it? Let's, let's suppose, let's suppose you have a very Puritan attitude about borrowing money, right? You, you scrape and you save. You watch every penny. Your family makes sacrifice. You eat leftovers. You wear hand-me-downs. And finally the time comes. You can't take it anymore. You have to borrow $50 from the bank to make ends meet. And then there's this other chap. He's reckless with money. He lives high on the hog. He drives a 2020 red Corvette. Never seems to work. Travels, plays golf all the time. He's a jet setter. And he's in debt thousands of dollars. Now the bank comes along and tells this other chap, and, and yourself, that both your debts are canceled. How do you feel? Let me explain the story in another light. Right? I've always been a good Christian. I was raised in a strict Christian home. I attend church regularly. I actually have a 15-year perfect attendance pin for coming to church. Well, sure, I, I committed a couple sins, but I'm a good Christian. But then there's this woman a woman of the city, and she, she drives this hot pink Cadillac. And she's lived her whole life in sin. She's never been to church. And then Jesus comes along and forgives both of us. In this parable, Jesus seems to be making a case for equality. In his forgiveness, we're all equal. 
The cross doesn't make a distinction. Some of us are not more equal than others. And quite frankly, that's exactly what's so unfair. There's nothing more unfair than equality. Jesus, surely my reward should be greater than that woman on the street. And if we're going to be completely honest here, God, I'm a little annoyed that you let her off. I mean, she should have been punished, shouldn't she? She deserved it. And I'm just as angry at the bank for erasing the debt of that playboy. He didn't deserve to get a break like that. This is all part of the offense that Simon feels at this dinner party. It's a Pharisee mentality. The forgiveness of Christ makes us equal with all sinners. Even a woman of the streets. It's almost intolerable because it's so unfair. We're much better. The Pharisees, they're so much better. Remember the, the parable of the, the worker in the vineyard some worked all day, some worked six hours, some worked three hours, some worked one hour. At the end of the day, they all get paid the same wage. And as you would expect, that doesn't sit very well with the people that worked all day. They weren't very happy. And here again, we see the great Christian offense. Equal rewards for varying levels of sin. There's no social class in the kingdom of heaven, is there? We're jealous of the guy who only worked one hour. We're jealous of the guy whose $1,000 loan is forgiven. We're jealous of the woman of the city. At the same time, we get a little annoyed with God. Our anger is just like that with the Pharisee had with Jesus. It emulates the anger of those who worked all day. Our anger mirrors the anger of the guy who only borrowed $50. It emulates the Pharisee. If he only knew what kind of woman she was, how could Jesus forgive this woman? Let's, let's pause for a moment and reflect. Because our dilemma just seems to be intensified. And maybe, maybe, we're understanding how Simon and the other Pharisee felt all too well. Could our problem be the exact same as the Pharisees? Have we as Christians in the year 2020 set ourselves above and apart? Do we envision ourselves better than others? Have we established ourselves as a class conscious judge of others? Have we been playing God? Judging and establishing degrees in our, our court system of forgiveness? Those rioters are never going to go to heaven. Those protesters, those looters, 
Surely they're less important than me. And those people marching in D.C. and Minneapolis and Seattle and Philadelphia and New York, they came from people of God. Look at them. You see, in our role as God, forgiveness really isn't too important to us. There's always something worse. Forgiveness really has little significance for us. If we're like God, what does forgiveness mean to us? In our lofty Christian ego trip, we've been observing, reckoning the sins of others so much that we've conveniently missed our own sins. Our life isn't to be devoted to be holding of other people's sins. We can't continually observe the sins of others. I need to see there's more good I could have done. I need to see my shortcomings. I need to see my own failure to help others. I need to see that I have sin. Jesus is constantly telling the Pharisee and us that we need to move down a few rungs on the ladder. Right? We can't regard ourselves as being above all others. We have to humble ourselves. We have to examine our own hearts our own lives, our own intentions. We have to examine our own motives, our own actions, our own deeds. We have to examine our responsibility as a Christian. Only when I'm able to behold, only when I'm able to see my own sin, and fully realize they are many. Does Jesus make any sense? Only in recognizing my own sins can I be grateful. Grateful to God and praise His name for the forgiveness He offers me, the sacrifice of His Son. Only then can I be filled with the spirit and joy of Jesus Christ. Therefore I tell you her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown much love. But the one whom little is forgiven, love little. From Luke 7. I need to realize that in fact, I'm the one who borrowed the large sum of money and had it forgiven. I'm the one who only worked an hour in a vineyard. I'm the woman of the city. I'm the one who has been forgiven much. All I can do now is love much. Folks, all we all can do is love much. We need to realize we are forgiven much. So much that Jesus died for all of us. Amen. I'd like to ask you to stand if you're able and join with me in reciting our United Church of Christ statement of faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, and to his deeds we testify. He calls the worlds into being, creates man in his own image, and sets before him the ways of life and death. He seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin, 
He judges men and nations by his righteous will, declared through the prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, he has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to himself. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. He calls us into his church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be his servants in the service of men, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. He promises to all who trust him forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, his presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in his kingdom, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we seem to have been coming to you now more than ever. And we're grateful that you're always here for us. Lord, we, we've been hit with so much that sometimes it seems hard Hard to continue, hard to press on. Hard to do the right thing, hard to say the right thing. But Lord, we know you're with us now and always. We pray, Lord, for our community of Warwickburg. Our St. John's community, our state of Pennsylvania, our United States of America, and the world, Lord. We ask for healing. We ask for decency. We ask for peace, kindness. Most of all, Lord, we ask for love. We ask you to look over our first responders, police, firemen, veterans, military personality, personnel both home and abroad, people on the front lines, our doctors, our nurses, grocery store attendants. Lord, be with them, keep them healthy. We ask you, Lord, to look over those suffering from addiction, those who are in prison. Let them know you, Lord. And we ask for, for healing. the family of Catherine Heimbaugh, and we ask for healing for our dear sister Susan McCartney. Lord, be with her. Let her know your love and how much she is loved by all of us. And we also pray for those who are on our mind not on our lips. These prayers, and all prayers, we pray in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
glory forever. Amen. And now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. May the, may the love of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.